So I was always fascinated, I think, by technology. So meaning applied science that's changing the world mm -hmm. around it. You should go to McKinsey because they will like your profile. Mm -hmm. And I knew a little bit of McKinsey, so it sounded like a good kind of next step. And now I think we realize like 80% of these apps we are not using. They're just sitting there on the phone. And so I think the next era is this conversational era. Environment is changing, microeconomic environment, everything is different from, let's say, two years ago. But I think we are still in a very strong position to lead our industry and also broader uh, tech space. Today we talked with Ivan Ostojic, who went from PhD in molecular biology to being a chief business officer in a startup unicorn. So I was always fascinated, I think, by technology. So meaning applied science that's changing the world mm -hmm. around it. And, um, you know, I actually had this kind of a balance because I thought, okay, um, I like natural sciences. I still like them and I, I think molecular biology is one of the most complex things uh, you can study um, because it describes, you know, how organisms work in a very granular mo molecular level. And, um, you know, I went for it because I saw that's the next wave that's coming. Um, but then, you know, I was still in a basic science. I had good publications and so forth. And I was interested in technology. So because I was in Zurich and there is uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, which is another fantastic institution that's also very stimulating. Uh, you know, people who do science, especially biomedical science, they're like, they can do three things because they have a lot of hands, at, a lot of time at their hands because you put, mm -hmm. you set up the experiments and then, you know, you have <laughs> free time. So there, there are three things you can do. So you can either read papers and go deeper. You can go and play sports, gym and stuff like that. And you come check your experiments. Or you could do something else. And because I was always curious and I was always interested in technology and economics, I met some guy who was doing a course of study at ETH in, in this um, you know, management technology and economics. And I got very interested and I realized, well, I can get, again, the best, one of the best educations in Europe for free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I actually, instead of doing sports and um, uh, you know, reading more papers, I actually wanted to broaden my views. So from there, I entered this interesting uh, world of technology management. Mm -hmm. And that kind of dualism then kept me a lot uh, through my career because I was very deep in healthcare, etc. But I always had this view on, you know, how to use the basic science uh, or the basic knowledge and transfer mm -hmm. it uh, to value for humanity, so i.e. technology. And that's, that's maybe why and how it was just like a um, lot of curiosity and energy and, and a lot of work. But I learned a lot because you start kind of understanding um, on one hand, you know, more, more deeper what you can do with, let's say, biology or, or biochemistry. And the other, how tech companies work because it was just, it was 2008. So at the time, mm -hmm. the big giants were just, just growing. And now what we have today, although I'm not in that field, uh, we have a confluence between you know, kind of um, digital technologies and life science. You see many pharma companies now basing their research program on AI. Mm -hmm. So I think over time, life science companies will start working like, like tech companies. Well, what drew you to the business side? I understand the curiosity and the science side, but usually people who work in science are not interested in the business side. Yeah, I think there is one, maybe even today, in a way, problem in education, maybe it's being solved. Um, I'm, I'm really interested, I was really interested in technology, mm -hmm. like, like, but not this kind of, okay, boring analytics, but really from a strategic side, you know, like a big thinking, how can we innovate or bring something new and just having, you know, going deeper in sort of basic science didn't give me that angle. Of technology, yes, I could have t thought about startups and so forth, but I really wanted to 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 know, you know, to understand the economy, to understand how that technology can contribute, uh, and how to drive progress. And then I felt like I, I believe in education. I always say this, you know, you, you can all learn on the way, but I felt like, oh, I would really profit from, you know, learning from other, let's say, business people mm -hmm. or technologists how to do it. So I entered business more through education, trying to mm -hmm. comprehend um, how to, you know, how to, first of all, um, understanding economical environment and how that drives certain things and then how to drive 
applications of basic science mm. in a way and that what draw me into business when it draw to business is that why you switch to specifically consulting in McKinsey where it's like very different topics all the time it was stimulating yeah, so that's an inter interesting story. So we actually, I never put this in CV because it didn't, was not last longer, but a couple of us actually had a startup really? in Zurich, okay, like so a digital startup. So <laughs> actually, you know, I, I kind of, again, I'm talking about this duality where I have two hats, like deep on one and then technology. So we had more tech, digital tech startup, but one of the founders found a job in IBM and he's a friend of mine. And I remember he told me like, okay, like now this is falling apart, but you should go to McKinsey because they will like your profile. Mm -hmm. And I knew a little bit of McKinsey, so it sounded like a good kind of next step uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> to build yourself. So uh, yes, I, I came to McKinsey with intent to, you know, really not just be a theoretical, but get some hands-on experience on the business mm -hmm. to open other opportunities. But mm -hmm. then when I came there, it was very exciting. So I stayed for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, at McKinsey, you uh, led a think tank called the Global Technology Council, and one of the deep dive groups was dedicated to machine learning, the other one to quantum computing. Uh, what did those sessions look like? Were there any other topics that now come to mind that were as interesting? Or Yeah, so I'll, I'll come to the think tank. I think I was very privileged to be in McKinsey in some sort of time of transition. So maybe mm -hmm. first uh, three or four years of McKinsey was more of a, let's say, standard strategy consulting. Yeah. You know, client kind of hires you, you do some thinking, brainstorming, problem solving, mm -hmm. and you drive projects. And then roughly around two, 2015, uh, McKinsey acquired an uh, AI company called Quantum Black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, this company was actually featured in British Economist and others. Um, uh, because they did some extraordinary thing in Formula One mm -hmm. uh, and uh, other kind of, they used big data to optimize HR processes, etc. Sorry, what was the reason McKinsey acquired the quantum? So this is an interesting story. So uh, we started collaborating, or McKinsey started collaborating with Quantum Black on a, on a specific project uh, where they were trying to optimize clinical trials in pharmaceutical industry using big Again. data. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we're back to med. The, yeah. Then the techie guys realized, oh, we don't know how to sell value to the C level and you know big programs. And McKinsey realized, well, we're not like a deep technical expert, but the marriage <laughs> somehow made sense. So then McKinsey acquired Quantum Black, and at the time, you know, I, I started being early adopter, so I worked a lot with. Mm -hmm. those capabilities. Then McKinsey acquired two or three design companies like um, Veriday, um, Lunar from San Francisco. So I was also early adopters to involve them in the project to drive kind of broader digital transformation because I was always interested in technology and innovation. And then the third thing was uh, McKinsey also uh, built a business building practice where we would partner with companies to build new businesses for them. So like traditional enterprises and then new businesses. So I was really kind of together with a bunch of colleagues pioneering that business building, we called it Leap. So we would like, you know, go to big enterprise and let's say if you have a traditional insurance and you want to build digital attackers, mm -hmm. you know, we would work with this company for a year with business builders and so forth. So that was, I just give you a context. That was kind of my path. And I always kept this duality. I did a lot of things in healthcare, but then on the other hand, I did a lot of things in tech. So mm -hmm. I always loved that positioning. And at some point, one of my colleagues, Nico and myself, uh, we said, look, um, we need to say something on emerging trends because people are not looking anymore for next year. And uh, technology adoption cycles are accelerating. Mm -hmm. So what it took you, I don't know, 30 years, decades ago to be adopted to, I don't know, 50%. Now you get it in maybe a matter of years. And as we saw now with OpenAI, maybe in a matter of months, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like yeah. rapid adoption that is enabled by confluence of various technologies. You know, because the fact is you have a cloud you can now expose, the adoption goes faster. So we thought, oh, we need to be able to say something very thoughtful about upcoming technology trends but not just have a high level view, but really go deep into some technology. So we set up this technology council such that it will scout for key tech trends, mm -hmm. but not just like McKinsey, really bring, you know, uh, prominent 
technology thinkers from outside, so like Benedict Evans, Azim Azar, mm -hmm. you know, those people, we were really having sessions where we were discussing, you know, tech future with them and then doing some analytical works and they were commenting on our work a little bit like at university. And then we said, okay, we need to have some deep dives on maybe tech topics. One that we are certain will have legs and then another one that's maybe a little bit more uncertain. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the certain tech trends was software 2.0. And this I always explained as software writing itself. Mm -hmm. okay. And now with generative AI, you see that this is becoming reality. But software 2.0 is not just so code writing itself. It's a set of tools that enable you to do programming or artificial intelligence in, in a much more automated way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, data automation of data cleaning, uh, reusable pieces of code. So we had one group that was really focusing on software 2.0 and then they decided to focus in particular at that time on machine learning operations because in the past machine learning was like a bunch of data scientists who crank some code and write it and then this was moving uh, into direction that you write AI code like you would write software. Mm -hmm. So you have libraries of codes that's already pre-written, you call those libraries, maybe you adjust, you have some algorithms that are checking models for biases and so forth. So all of this MLOps was something that we were li literally devising. There were people from Tesla, because they were actually, nice. they're pretty advanced in using this technology from Netflix. They were lectures. So that was one which was here and now, mm -hmm. and that was kind of exciting part. And then there was another exciting uh, part, which is more emerging, really emerging tech, mm -hmm. which is relatively uncertain, but if it works, it can change the world completely. And that was quantum computing. Okay. And really, I mean, I was really privileged to sit with those people and discuss the future. So there was um, um, uh, a CEO of SciQuantum. It's one of the leading companies. There were a couple of CEOs of emerging quantum um, uh, companies, uh, whether it's like Zapata, which is more on the uh, hardware side, or, um, uh, sorry, Zapata is on the software side. Mm -hmm or uh, on, on, on the hardware side like D-Wave and so forth, like we literally had very senior stakeholders that disagree what will be the dominant technology that compete with each other, but talking about you know, the future trend. And then we set the future trend of quantum computing and how can it change the world, where it can be applied, what's the maturity. Mm -hmm. And we thought as McKinsey, we need to kind of Bring this, down, bring this down to business leaders to understand what's the maturity of this technology, should I be doing something or not, and actually if this is successful, in which domains of the business this mm -hmm. will be transformative, right, mm -hmm. based on what tech can do. Mm -hmm. So for example, simulating carbon capture enzymes, because today chemistry is a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. but you know, with quantum computing, theoretically it would be possible to simulate, like doing silico experiments and really find the optimal enzyme that can capture carbon from CO2 and then we kind of mm -hmm. potentially have a path to solving um, a, a climate problem mm -hmm. and so forth and so forth. So we really work on what would be the value of this technology, mm -hmm. what are the swing factors, what's roughly the timeline or the stages and what are the use cases by the industry and then there was like a massive report we published on that, so I really went into kind of depth Deep dive. of that technology. I was involved in, uh, there was another colleague who actually is a big machine learning expert, Giacomo Corbo, he led the software 2.0 slash MLOps group. I was participating in the session, it was extremely interesting to hear, I won't name now the car companies for, um, for privacy, but we heard that one of the kind of attacker automotive company with 30% of people like a major automotive producer, they can do more Mm -hmm. in terms of machine learning and AI because they use these modern techniques of MLOps and probably with higher quality. So, I mean, like these kind of insights, you know, we had and then we were trying to create the playbook, how can big corporations enter this field? So that was like really extremely exciting and also writing a report. Now it became kind of an annual thing. So McKinsey mm -hmm. publishes every year, um, you know, what will be the tech trends and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned AI a few times, software 2.0. Um, you obviously had a lot of insight and you knew that something was coming, but were you able to predict that uh, the change will be so sudden? 
we sort of predicted generative AI, but it's very hard to predict on exact form how it looks. So, so here is the quote from the first report. We said, you know, there was an era of more general, general AI, kind of mm -hmm. models, cranking, you know, churn prediction, mm -hmm. stopping somebody churn or recommending next best action. We believe that the next era that's coming is era, we called it at the time, applied AI. So that machines will be able to read, to write, to hear, and, you know, to see. Mm -hmm. That was kind of how we sort of frame it in one of the reports. And I had many discussions with the clients. Now, it kind of frames, but it's very hard to stipulate exactly how it looked. Mm -hmm. So what caught me a little bit by surprise, so I know the trend is coming. And I think the other trend that we predicted linked to that is the software 2.0. Because mm -hmm. soon we will see auto-generated yeah. code yeah. Yeah. available to large masses. But the, the thing that really surprised me, I was not surprised so much that this is coming within two or three years. We saw by patents and so forth that something in this area will make a breakthrough. In this case, the first breakthrough was ability to kind of write yeah. or synthesize language. I think we'll see more application with, uh, with kind of visual analyzes. But mm -hmm. what surprised me is the level of democratization that happened. Mm -hmm. How fast it was exposed to the wider community mm -hmm. and the adoption. And I think, I think the other thing, what we said in this report, and I spoke this often about this, it's not, we had, let's say at the time, major 10 tech trends. Some were deep tech, some were software. But uh, what I said, the big insight of this report is not one technology or two technology. It's actually combinatorial effect of these technologies that will accelerate the adoption. Mm -hmm. So let me just explain you. Uh, what we mean by, so one of the tech trends was like cloud, right? That was a big, we, you couldn't miss it. Yeah. Uh, cloud and edge. Uh, and then the other trend is quantum computing. So if quantum computing, let's say, happened 50 years ago, the adoption of quantum computing would be relatively slow because people would need to somehow learn new language. They would need to switch from one, you know, big server to another server, yeah. Yeah. et cetera, et cetera. The fact that we have cloud that's now widespread means that if quantum computing really makes technological breakthrough to have um, you know, error-corrected quantum computers and so forth, that means that you will just be able to expose these quantum processors on the existing cloud infrastructure. And probably there'll be some smart software people that will write the code that you can even use standard coding languages to call quantum libraries. Right? Mm -hmm. That means you compress this adoption from probably decades into a year. So that was my big insights when I was looking at a big, big insight when I was looking at all of these trends. I said this is all working together because the fact that we have infrastructure sensors that are feeding data into a cloud and that we have software that's writing itself, we can write gazillion applications all of a sudden. But seeing that, you know, one thing is to think about it. So it was very logical that something like this will happen and that the adoption will be rapid. But seeing it playing out in reality in few in a matter of few months, mm -hmm. it was still shocking. <laughs> with me, you know, it's like a little bit like when you talk about things and you put on paper and then you're like, wow. <laughs> it's actually happening. Yeah, it's yeah. actually <laughs> happening. So, you you know, we were conceptually describing everything, but actually when it happened in reality, it took another twist. Mm. So I think that taught me, you know, it's it's easy, it's not easy. It's it, it, Logically, you can see the trends, but it's very hard to say exactly how they will play out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's why experimentation, trying, and so forth is important. Yeah. Like companies need to really get their hands dirty with technology in a way, do concrete projects in order to experience things. Because, you know, conceptually we understood actually roughly, I'm proud yeah. that we understood what could happen and how, but still, you know, seeing it in reality it had a different taste. Like magic. <laughs> yes. You mentioned your duality. So technology and science and now like something akin to translating to business. That's something that you mentioned as a term in a podcast called the Quibit Guys podcast. Um, what do you think is the hard part of being a business translator? Um, and also, where can we find more of them, people like you? Is it in science or? Yeah, that's actually interesting because business translator is somebody who you know knows enough of technology to be dangerous and kind of propose ideas, but <laughs> not really going into depth of coding, but then understand the business to take so what and so. Uh, 
-hmm. and extract, uh, you know, the values and applications mm -hmm. for the business. Um, because what we saw in early days, let's say, of machine learning and AI is, you know, mathematicians are very good in kind of cranking numbers in gazillion ways. And sometimes they come to insights that they look like very new to them. Mm -hmm. But actually, if, if you look what that means for a business, it's kind of trivial. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know there was like a project, I don't want to name a big company that was working for a pharmaceutical company and sort of um, doing some big data cranking in the early days. This pharmaceutical company was in mental health and that they found out like, oh, you know, pe people commit more suicide at the, at the times of extreme heat. Okay, I mean, great insight from the big data, but I didn't need big data to tell me this. That was gazillion research. So then the business translators really can sort of ask the right question for the mm -hmm. business. And then, you know, at the, being embedded in this data science or other teams, they can like very quickly iterate, right? They could show me this insight. I'll say that's nothing new for the industry. Let's like mm -hmm. <laughs> try to find something else and you know help help structure the data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So gain context. Y yeah, gain context, but also making sure you know the right question is being asked mm -hmm. and iterating rapidly on the insights to get to really to the depth mm -hmm. of. So that makes teams more productive and also bringing sort of new ideas, new questions. And I think they're essential part of the teams to accelerate delivery of the projects in analytics in um, in the future, I believe in quantum computing as well, because you know, quantum scientists need to be geeks. I mean, you can't yeah. be quantum <laughs> scientists, but then you need somebody who understands the business, you know, to help them be faster, be more targeted. So I, I think, you know, it's kind of, I mean, profiles maybe like mine or others really that have this curiosity and enough depth and technical education to be able to understand what people are doing but then really can connect with with business with impact and so forth mm -hmm. and I think you know um, talking about uh, people are always worried that technology will remove some jobs but actually every time when we had big technology breakthrough over shorter or medium period of time it's so that new more jobs were created because then yeah. you know it maybe removes some jobs but then it opens opportunity for new jobs. So I think with all the advances of, you know, the tech, we'll need more of these business translators. So I think universities should consider creating this kind of programs, duality programs mm -hmm. between, you know, deep tech or programming or data science, whatever, and then certain mm -hmm. business verticals so they can really connect the mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then it's also how you build yourself. You need a bit of experience, right? It's not just what you learn in school, but it's, you being know, exposed to yeah. being exposed to yeah. yeah so this also applies to your current position at infobit can you please uh, go into a bit of specifics of your scope of work here do you still feel like a business translator or did it evolve into something else so we have great engineers here so i wouldn't get too much into their area but yes i think um my scope of business here i'm a chief business officer so i oversee um a company strategy uh, I oversee, uh, you know, various go-to-market teams and then uh, functions that are uh, uh, helping to execute uh, those go-to-market strategies, which is marketing uh, partnership, developer experience, and some part of our revenue. Um, and, you know, with that work, it's actually similar. I often have to work with our really product experts that almost kind of invented some categories in this industry, mm -hmm. but also help bridge you know, what they are building with like industry realities, what is business persona looking like mm -hmm. or looking for, uh, you know, how can we position our products in that direction, uh, what innovation we need to drive to help them drive their agenda further and mm -hmm. so forth. So to an extent, I do still feel like a business translator because we're very often in this discussion between products, which I find really technical and mm -hmm. really deep, and then the business side and the customer side. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we are building our customer-centric strategy. We're, you know, um, advancing our products and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you still feel like a business translator because let's try to do some business translation. A few <laughs> kind of quick shots. Uh, we'll try to uh, translate for our audience, or you will, um, at least on the industry that we're now a part of communications. Um, first question. Uh, what do you think is the current global landscape as far as chat apps go 
and its implications for info, what are like opportunities, challenges, and what should like our audience think of like yeah, so, what's coming? So the global landscape is like this, you know, good old technologies still persist. So SMS is very important and has the highest volume, mm -hmm. but very rapidly we have various chat apps that went through wave of peer-to-peer -peer adoption, like mm -hmm. WhatsApp, Google RCS, Apple Messages for Business, which is like iMessage. Yeah. Um, and etc. And that they are now opening up for businesses to enable businesses to build different, let's say, experiences, meaning parts or full customer journeys within just messaging apps. And I think I think you know uh, the penetration of these apps, meaning a lot of people having them, the richness that they provide, able to put catalogs button etc. Uh, and new features that they are bringing as well as our ability to embed different pieces of technologies within this like bots mm -hmm. or other types of technology like analytics is creating a whole new opportunity because you know the world was always working in some let's call it technology waves so when it came to customer experience first you had a physical experience let's say store you needed to go to a shop to buy something then there was an era of web so everybody had a website and a web yeah. portal yeah. Then there was an era of apps and omnichannel. You had to have Everyone an email, an but then everybody has to have an app. And now I think we realize like 80% of these apps we are not using. They're just sitting there on the phone and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think the next era is this conversational era where we will be able to either, you know, apps that we don't use so often or parts of the customer journeys, even for the apps that we use often, we will be able to move them to these conversational apps and people will be able to do something like to buy their favorite product that's on promotion or you know quickly impulsively find something or like we have use cases with clinics mm -hmm. to find like location of the clinics and things like that like simple mm -hmm. things you can just go to your you know whatsapp or whatever chat app you're using and you can kind of chat with the business and i think infobip is really with all the technologies that we use but also with the expertise and depth in the channel mm -hmm. so we are in all alpha our apis are most up to date with like all of the features it's a really unique position to help businesses, you know, do this, call it transition or complementation of their current channels mm -hmm. and really extract maximal value from these mm -hmm. chat apps. Okay, so scratch one question about conversation, like everything, we talked about that. <laughs> um, getting back to something that we actually mentioned earlier today, and uh, so omnichannel is something that has been the new normal, um, but is like, the CX experience is still not like seamless. What do you think can be improved building on what you said already? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we did recently, I think with IDC, a study in Europe mm -hmm. and I won't be very precise on numbers, but we kind of show that like, like roughly up to, up to 20% of companies are just using one or two channels. Mm -hmm. Then actually around 50% of companies are call it multi-channel. So they use more than one than two channels, but they're not really integrated mm -hmm. in a yeah. way. And then and then you have maybe 20 to 30% of companies which are real kind of true omni-channel that have mm -hmm. everything integrated, the data is coming together and so forth. So that's kind of reality on the field. And I believe in this when I, when I see it. And I think, I think what will be different now is platform like ours that have all of these different channels. First of all, natively integrated, meaning like they're all coming together. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it's very easy to activate them just through some API. Mm -hmm. And we also have, you know, data platform that can provide the analytics to see who's responding to which channel and which message. So with these three things, so integration, easy activation and the data, uh, what will be different is really, um, really kind of starting to provide through omni-channel experience so meaning somebody shows up on your website there is a widget call it live chat that provides a rich channel there they can ask the question for your business search for a product mm -hmm. buy something you will have some of their data you can re-engage them then through you know Another through channel. email through mm -hmm. whatsapp and you can start to compartmentalize certain journeys if it's mm -hmm. a big problem maybe they get a call if it's a small problem, move them to a chat to solve a customer support. If it's a promotion, you know, maybe use email followed with the chat channel and all of this data is coming together. And then there is sort of a brain that can decide what experience to launch, 
to which customer at which ch channel based on the predicted response of that customer. So actual and omni channel. That's the actual omni channel, but you can't do it without, uh, we provide one stop shop for that, but whether it's us or somebody else, you can't do it without this true integration and this sort of brain, let's say data platform that has a memory over time. Is that AI then? Yeah. A AI yeah. is part of it, but it's not the only, you need to have channels, mm -hmm. you need yeah. to have, you know, way to kind of get real da time data from these channels. And yes, you need to have some analytics for this. So that's kind of, I, I believe, what will change now. Mm -hmm. awesome. I, I really loved your face when we were talking about this. It <laughs> starts glowing a bit. <laughs> well, uh, and, and I wanted to ask you a question that is completely unrelated to this is, uh, if you could name one thing about your current job uh, that is most fulfilling, what would that be? We have amazing, really, technology that's maybe, first of all, uh, we used to say in the past, it's it's uh, a best kept secret, <laughs> Yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because uh, we didn't invest so much in branding. Uh, somebody told the other day, you know, for every dollar that maybe a competitor would invest in branding, we invested two dollars in engineering. Mm -hmm. So getting, you know, that technology exposed to the world, talking more openly about it and so forth, it's one task that I took on myself. And then, and then with that, you know, working with customers directly to use that technology to drive impact, you know, helping people in critical situations, helping patients, you know, in let's say countries like India find the doctors, uh, get their symptoms and do telemedicine through something like WhatsApp, mm -hmm. you know, like using full breadth of this technology to drive solutions that solve people problems, then bring me to the beginning of our story Mm -hmm. and the passion for technology, how can we use mm -hmm. something to make, you know, humanity or somebody's life better? That's probably the most fulfilling. Um, as far as uh, social networks, you're most active on LinkedIn. What uh, drew you there? Why not, also, why not TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, I like thought-provoking things and more kind of um, on the point of business and, um, you know, progress of technology. So I found most of these other social networks that you find, there's too much sort of destruction, the destruction and as is one famous F economist said, you know, when there is abundance of information, there is deficit of attention. So mm -hmm. I find LinkedIn really helped me focus on what I'm more passionate about, which is like business and technology. Mm -hmm. And there is not, there is a little bit, but it gets very easily, quickly filtered to the network, this kind of show off. Yeah. You know, we are really on the content, not like, oh, I was here. Yeah. And so I don't have so much distractions. I can really focus on what I like and, you know, somehow share something with people. I think it's interesting. I often share articles and not just about InfoBip. And I can also learn from others because mm -hmm. often I see some exciting things and I can go deeper and read it. So I, I find it very, like, informative and, um, you know, it doesn't drive me to attention deficit because it's very mm -hmm. focused on a few topics. <laughs> uh... Yeah. Well, uh, last we, question. yeah, we have <laughs> one surprise question, which uh, I will draw out my head. Kidding. Of course. <laughs> we actually did an interview with uh, your boss, CEO of InfoBip, Silvio. Uh, so he actually has a question for you. So now we are going to listen to it. After one year and a half, like how he sees his impact and is he happy in the direction that we are changing this industry? There, there's this term in McKinsey, kind of unsecure overachiever. <laughs> so I will never be happy. Oh, we are, you know, I think we can always do more. But I think, you know, uh, we're building a certain future together, all of us here in InfoBip. Uh, first of all, uh, creating sort of impact with our clients and then also moving InfoBip from a company that was more kind of resembling something like a telco to more of a tech company. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at this period, let's say if we achieved this yes i think we did some very um, interesting and positive change that maybe elevate our visibility that uh, draw the, the cutting edge thinking further building on strong products that we had but more into kind of applications toward business uh, that's around setting the strategy and as well uh, that um, you know help uh, this company drive more toward kind of real um, tech champion. And mm. Now, of course, we are on the path, so we shouldn't declare the victory, but I think I'm happy for, for the path that we all 
set together uh, within the last year, year and a half. I think we are moving in the right direction. Um, environment is changing, microeconomic environment, everything is different from, let's say, two years ago. But I think, I think you know, we are still in a very strong position to lead our industry and also a broader uh, tech space, especially on the, on the backdrops of these strong tech trends that I um, mentioned earlier. So in that sense, I'm happy with the path that we crafted and where we are going. Whether everything is perfect, probably not. But you know, are we driving in the right direction? And does this keep me motivating? Uh, yes, and I think I think I'm proud of that. Like really, because I still we are feel, still driving impact, not just for us, but for the environment around us. Awesome. As thank we you, said, thank you so much, Ivan, for being part of the podcast. Thank you all. <laughs>